Uh, my name is Rachel Bloom with the CSU Alumni Association, and we're very glad that you've decided to join us. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to say our hearts are obviously very heavy for Boulder, Colorado right now, uh, and that these are challenging times. So we hope this webinar can provide something that maybe inspires you about your garden, um, and we can get back to the heaviness after this webinar, but thinking of everybody today. Um, so this is our integrated pest management third event in our gardening series. So I'm super excited that you all are here. Uh, pest management is obviously very important with any garden and so a very uh, interesting and hopefully helpful topic for you all as you start to plan your beautiful spring and summer gardens. A big thank you to our series sponsor, Fossil Creek Nursery, and we'll be including their website in the chat as well. Um, and thank you for participating today. If you feel like it, go ahead and put in the chat, click all panelists and attendees, and just let us know where you're watching from. And if you'd like to include your graduation year as well, we do always love to see that too. But wherever you're tuning in from, we are so, so glad that you're here. If we wanna go ahead and go to the next slide as well, John. Um, and thank you to so many of our awesome attendees who are CSU Alumni Association members. Uh, thank you so much for that membership. It does make events and engagement that we do possible. And we have another slide next about our membership with different benefits that we have as well. So if you have any interest or questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me. It's just a great way to get back in touch with your university. As a reminder, since this is a webinar, you are automatically muted with your camera off. So please just utilize the Q&A and the chat to ask any questions throughout the presentation. We'll have some time at the end to get through some of your questions as well, which I'm looking forward to. In just a moment, I'll also add to the chat some interesting um, helpful tips with technology if you need that, as well as some links to our calendar and upcoming events as well as different virtual engagement resources. And then at the end of the event, I'll be putting a survey into the chat. If you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to fill that out, it definitely helps provide us feedback and let us know how we're doing. And there's actually a spot if there was events you know, that you're interested in us having, we always love your ideas uh, for events as well. So I am not the expert today. I am very excited to introduce you to our event speaker, John. John works for the CSU Extension Office in Jefferson County, and he specializes in food systems, plant pathology, and general horticulture. Why is that a hard word in the, in the speaking world? Horticulture, excuse me. He received a master's degree from the University of Federal de Santa Maria in Southern Brazil, where he researched agroforestry cropping systems, botany and public health. And he is passionate about sustainable food production, urban agriculture, apartment gardening, social equity and food justice, which is just such a fun bio. And I had to read the whole thing, John, because I just loved it. So thank you so much for being here. I hope I didn't butcher it too badly. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you again. It was perfect. Um, and thank you, Rachel, for inviting me here today to speak with you all. Um, it's, it's my pleasure. We have a whole bunch of content to cover. Um, and so we're just gonna get into it. And I, I think we'll hold, I'm gonna try to make some time at the end of the presentation to answer any questions and maybe, you know, enter into a dialogue with you all to see if there are any follow-up questions you might have. So integrated pest mineral topic I'm gonna be speaking to you about today. I have a few objectives. One, I want to discuss the, the toolbox of integrated pest management or IPM. I also want to present information for like a, a systems approach, an ecosystem approach to, to gardening. Um, I want to introduce you to a project that is very near to me or very dear and near. Um, it's called Grow and Give. It's a program that was started with CSU Extension. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about. So I'm going to interject a little pieces about that program throughout the presentation. And then really, my underlying objective, and I think the objective of all Extension agents, is to connect you, to connect our audience, to connect Coloradoans with resources. And so I'm going to be doing that all along the way. And one of the most um, powerful, I think, tools that I can give you today is this right here. Um, it's, it's a way you can restrict Google searches to produce, um, to display EDU sources. And so what I mean by this is you would enter a search term, say, I've got spots on my tomato or spotty tomato leaf or circular rings in my lawn, right? Could be anything. That's your search term. Then add in CSU if you want to. I would 
promote that for sure. And then at the end of your search, write site colon dot edu. And by doing that, you will most likely return a list of extension-based resources, which, and you'll filter out a lot of the miscellaneous forums and, and strange kind of web pages that you can come across. And so with extension, we you can be a little more certain or you can rest you know, assured that at least with CSU extension, our information is peer reviewed. We work with professors to you know, make sure our information is accurate research and data-based. Um, so site colon dot edu is a huge, huge trick that I highly recommend. And in doing that, say, I don't know, uh, we have a drought coming up. I mean, we are in a drought now. How do we water during drought? So vegetable garden, watering, drought. The first thing that came up when I typed this in with the site colon.edu trick is a CSU fact sheet on exactly this topic. And a fact sheet breaks down a topic you know, chunk by chunk and, and it's made for, for a huge range of people for a broad audience. So for special for specialists, uh, specialists, excuse me, and um, you know, lay, more lay people. Um, but sometimes you don't know maybe what you're looking for. I you know don't know what all resources we have even sometimes. You know, I, I work with horticulture, but we also have family consumer sciences, and so we have resources in, in those fields. And it can be hard to search for something when you, you know, may not have an idea for what exists. So with Grow and Give, we recently, just last week, went live with a new uh, website that we put together that combines all of the work that extension agents in horticulture did last year into a single place. You know, so we have refreshed all of our information, updated some things, did some sprucing up with how we display information on websites. And it's on, you can find a lot of this gardening information on growandgivecolorado.org. Um, just it's a huge resource, and I'm going to get into some of the resources we have on this website a bit later. One of my favorite resources, though, that I have to just uh, mention before going on is the Colorado Vegetable Guide, which we also have in Spanish. And it breaks down, I think, the first 20 or so pages, you know, general gardening topics, you know, soil. What about soil temperature? What about fertilizing? What about nutrients? And it goes topic by topic. And then the bulk of this like 175-ish page document goes crop by crop. And it gives you examples for, you know, how do I grow tomatoes at high altitudes, for example. It just goes plant by plant. And you can find this information at the Grow and Give website. So integrated pest management, what is this? It's a scary term for a really, really kind of simple principle or simple philosophy for managing problems or pests in a garden. The idea is that integrated pest management looks at the broad picture of things. So we're looking at an ecosystem, we're looking at a plant itself, right? The host, we're looking at pests. Where do pests fit in with the larger ecosystem around it? And how can we manipulate some of these factors to accomplish a goal, which would be managing our pests, right? And so I've broken this down into a couple different areas. We're gonna go through each one of these uh, during this presentation. Um, but we're gonna begin with problem identification. This is really the most critical and crucial part of IPM and integrated pest management, in my opinion, um, because if you don't, because if you know what the problem is, well, then you can really look at how these things are connected within our system, how that problem is connected with the broader picture. And I'm really wanting to use this lens of IPM, this ecosystem approach to planning a garden. I mean, since we are still in the early season, I think that may be one of the more relevant things. So I'm just gonna, let's get into it. Um, problem identification, let's make one up right now. I want to prevent plant pests and diseases from taking over my garden, okay? Well, what are some factors that can influence a garden? Well, we have plant species, um, you know, heirloom uh, vegetables or heirloom tomatoes are much more susceptible to certain diseases than our hybrid 
tomatoes. And this applies for a huge variety of vegetable plants. And so it's really important to know what, know what host you're planting, what species, what vegetable you're planting. And then what are the common pests that can you know, attack a garden of heirloom tomatoes? It's important to know that. And then what cultural practices are we gonna be using? And, and by cultural practices, I mean, how are we watering? You know, are you going to be using a timer on a on a automated system to water your garden? Are you going to be hand watering? Is are you mulching? You know, things like that. Things about things about your garden that aren't you know directly related to to you know, planting to pests, but it's the big picture, right? How are you developing the culture of your garden? One other tool I want to I want to address before we dive in, in, in any deeper is the um, disease uh, triangle here for plants disease for plant diseases. A disease requires oh, excuse me, a, disease, a disease requires three things to exist. You need a host that's susceptible to a disease. You need a pathogen um, and you need an environment through which the pathogen can flourish. If you can the point of this is it gives us a framework for beginning to break down problems that can exist in our garden. So the idea is if you can break one of these linkages, if we can prevent a pathogen from reaching the host, we're not going to have a problem. Or we could say a pest from reaching the host. Maybe it's rabbits and a lawn. If we can make some sort of barrier, if we can prevent that, um, pest from reaching our host, then we won't have a disease. Similarly, if we can modify the environment a little bit, you know, maybe it's a watering regimen. If we can reduce watering in some cases, we can prevent a lot of pest problems from ever occurring. And same with the host. Sometimes, uh, thankful to our technology, thankfully to, to our technology, we have resistant varieties of many, many, many plants. And so, you can plant a resistant variety, well, maybe you can prevent problems from ever occurring. This is just a component, a, a tool to consider more broad problems. And note, I've only now started to talk about actually managing the pathogen or pest itself directly. And in doing that, we have many sub tools, right? We have cultural strategies, thinking about watering again, but we also have mechanical means. Um, Weeding, of course, being the most obvious to me, but there are many others, and I'll get to some of those later. We have biological controls, and we have, of course, a range of chemical means at our disposal, uh, ranging from organic products to synthetic products. We just have a whole host of possibilities available to us, and that's what IPM is really about. Let's take the big picture and see what we can do. So, We've identified a problem, perhaps. It's also really important to consider action thresholds and what pests are. A pest can vary. That definition can vary person by person. Personally, I love dandelions. I think they're pretty flowers. I like the poof balls, and they're great sources of food and pollen for bees in the early season. Um, but I have a story from when I was a, in college we would get a mass influx in our dorm of lady beetles, of ladybugs. Every year, they would just swarm our dormitory. And my, my roommate hated these lady beetles. He just couldn't stand them because they would come in, they would fly around and whatever. Me, I love them. You know, it's more life around me. I'm a horticulture agent. This is really what I'm into. So, you know, it's fine. But he contacted um, some maintenance people and then asked them to spray some product unknown within our dormitory to control for these lady beetles. To him, these were a major pest and that threshold of a mass influx or infestation of these bugs was too much. For me, my action threshold was much higher. But in your gardens, you know, you may have a single dandelion and for one person, hey, that is enough of a problem to warrant weeding it, so pulling it out or treating for it. To someone else, not a big deal, but that varies person by person. And so 
it's just, it's a nice starting place when you're thinking about or seeing a problem or encountering a problem. Is this something that's really worth treating? Is it gonna be a problem in the long run? Keeping in mind, it's often easier to, to address a potential problem early on. And so there's a whole bunch of information here that is helpful to consider. And that's really where extension, I think, is, is very effective and powerful. Um, and that we're across the state. You can call us or talk with us on Ask an Expert. I have a slide on that coming up in just a bit. But another component of IPM is, is knowing the, the host what, and knowing what is normal for that plant. You know, there are a huge, <laughs> there's a wide, wide array of variegated plants that have this really kind of unique coloring that's normal for a plant. At the same time, we know some plant pathogens create really strange um, looking colorations. You know, Alternaria leaf blight is a common uh, leaf, um, a leaf, common leaf spot that affects a huge variety of plants. Um, it's caused by a fungus. And my point with this slide is just, it's really important to know your host and then if you can, to identify what the pathogen or problem or pest might be so that you can really directly address it. Um, yeah. Ah, ask an expert. So it's trying to get at extension being really helpful. You can call us, um, you can email us, but also there's this online program. Uh, it's nationwide, but if you type in a question here, um, it will be filtered down to the location where you are in Colorado and sent to your most, your nearest extension agent, and they'll get you an answer in a couple of days. You know, it's, we're here to help, really. I mean, because there is a lot of information here. It takes a specialty in some cases to know what to look for. That's what this helps with. Okay, so problem identification, identifying your host, right? Critically important, knowing if a pathogen is present and identifying that is also critically important. Um, so let's talk a little bit about planning and prevention and cultural controls. Imagine you are a grasshopper jumping around. Your life is you know, fairly pleasant. You're hopping leaf to leaf, chewing up some things here and there, chewing up some leaves, eating some tomato plants. Which of these environments is going to be more pleasant for you? right? You're trying to avoid birds from eating you. Personally, I think the jungle of the tomato plants on your left would be much more pleasant, right? It's going to be harder for birds to get in there. It's going to allow a pest to proliferate, right? It's just a wonderful area for pests or disease to proliferate. Whereas the, on the right, you know, you have these really direct lines we have airflow that's getting into the plants, which is also really important, that cuts down on humidity, which is very, very important. I know we live in a very arid and dry climate environment here in Colorado, but we, you do have these microclimates in these miniature jungles, in, such as in this picture. And those microclimates can have a huge impact on pathogens that are present. So we're thinking IPM, right? We're thinking the large ecosystem here. How can we design our garden ahead of time to prevent potential problems down the road? And just some garden planning is a very, a very effective tool for preventing tons of problems down the road. So one of these pathogens, Alternaria leaf blight, causes something called early blight in, uh, or Alternaria is a fungus, causes early blight. Um, it's a leaf spot. It's spread by droplets of water splashing on one of these leaf spots, spreading its spores to other leaves, further infecting the plant. My tomato, I don't know what they are. What, what do I do next? Ah, well, yeah, that was a point on. Alternately, will spread a little bit better in a jungle of tomatoes than a, a, a clear delineated line and garden plant tomato patch. But back to the alternate, 
you can Google for these leaf spots or CSU Extension has put together a recognizing tomato problems fact sheet, which breaks down, you know, leaves. Ah, oh, we have curly leaves. We have odd black striated circular patterns. And it can help filter out or filter down to what your problem might be. And the point of this again is so that we can get you the right product if that's necessary or give you the right tool in this large IPM toolbox, right? It could be mechanical means. Maybe it's best to just clip it out. Sometimes that's the case. Um, so again, our goal here is problem identification and planning ahead as best we can. So maybe, maybe this is benign, maybe it's not a big deal, or maybe it is. Further, um, we have catered documents to a huge range of these problems. So for early blight, for example, the recommendation is that once the disease causes a leaf to start yellowing, fungicides are really going to be much less effective than if this problem were treated early on. And so based on the, the I guess, the presence of this disease on a tomato plant, we can offer recommendations once we know what it is, right? Or else, I guess the al an alternative, which we would not want to promote, is just going to a big box store uh, and whatever product and spraying it on our plant without knowing. It might work, but you're kind of just rolling the dice in that case. So IPM again, let's, be, let's take a mindful approach to managing our problems in our garden. Oh, whoops. Okay, yeah, so cultural controls. I think we, we've covered some of that. We're gonna, we're gonna continue covering it a little bit more in, in further slides. Essentially, our goal with cultural controls is to reduce uh, the presence of pests, the, the intensity of pest pressures on a garden. So how can we do that, right? Garden planning is a component of this. So what we want for our plants is for them to be as healthy as possible, to produce as much as possible. And for that, they need to be happy, you know? And so we know some shade between lines, between individual plants is very helpful for reducing um, the, well, you can read here, reducing evaporation from the soil because you won't have direct sun beating down on the soil around a plant. And so you're gonna reach the soil retains a little bit more moisture because it's if it's properly planned, you can still have airflow, but get all of these little benefits from like, for example, reducing evaporation. And of course, if we're blocking sunlight from the soil, we're gonna have a less or a lesser or a smaller problem with weeds. Similarly, you may have had or seen or experienced a split tomato in the past, right? You have a beautiful tomato and then right down the middle, it's just kind of split and insects can get in there and just can get kind of nasty and gross on the vine even. Often that's caused by irregularities in watering. Early on, maybe the plant received a lot of water. Later on, maybe I wasn't so attentive and I didn't water as much, or maybe vice versa, right? Or maybe there's another problem present. So grouping your plants by their water needs can also prevent problems from occurring because we want the plants to be as happy as possible. And mixing these things together, you know, mixing a tomato with, a, with an onion or a lettuce and watering those all the same amount could, could cause some issues. Your results may vary, you know. Fortunately, once again, we have put together, CSU Extension has put together a ton of garden plans. We have, we have, we've developed these with those IPM considerations in mind. Um, specifically, we did a recent update and we have a whole bunch of first time gardener plans. We have a salsa garden or a squash garden. These are just, basic garden plans you can use as launching points um, that take into those, take those IPM considerations into mind. You know, they're, they're made, they're, they were planned with those things uh, from the very beginning. So these are just starting points to show you that we have a ton of resources available. That's again, Extension's job is to show you, to connect you to resources that might be helpful. Monitoring. 
Okay, monitoring. I don't think I need to spend too much time on this topic. It, it's just the idea to be mindful of what's going on in a garden, right? It's not necessarily set it and forget it, or I mean, you certainly could set it and forget it, but you might come back to a, a garden with, you know, more um, pests than fruit in it. So just be mindful of, you know, what's going on. You know, check it every once in a while. Take a look at the leaves of your plants every so often, you know, a couple times a month even would be okay. And there also, this also brings up the question of thresholds, of action thresholds. It, a problem to one person, right, is not going to be a problem maybe necessarily to another person. A single weed though, or a small row of small weeds are going to be much easier to pick early on than they will be once those weeds develop deep intertwined tap roots that mix all together. Fortunately, we can prevent or avoid a lot of those problems with weeds early on by mulching. Uh, mulching accomplishes two things directly. One, it, it blocks, um, well, it can prevent problems with weeds and two, it conserves moisture as this slide shows. Um, and I have a little more on that in another slide. So monitoring, okay. In my field, in horticulture, the question of whether I should use or whether a person should use plastic mulch comes up fairly frequently. And to be honest, it's a, it's a challenging topic because it depends so much upon where the mulch is being used. For vegetable gardens, I would encourage the use of plastic mulch but there are a bunch of caveats that I have to add here because black plastic, or this could be fabric mulch, it'll say that it's, it's sold with, with pores that allow airflow into the soil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, in the early season, when we still have really cool temperatures, it's great. You can extend your growing season. They, it heats up the ground actually. So it absorbs light, right? And traps a little bit of warmth and can help promote a garden in the early season. But midsummer comes around, we get the beating hot sun, that black plastic can heat up so much that it can be a, become a detriment to plants that it's you know, planted around. But if you're, I keep using the example of tomatoes, but if your tomato plants are, have grown large enough by midsummer to shade that black plastic, you're not gonna have much of a problem then because you're not gonna have that issue of, of um, excessive heat and temperature. So black plastic in vegetable gardens, highly recommended, but also those pores that it says it's sold with, those can become clogged and, and really prevent airflow if the uh, that black plastic is not pulled up every year. So it takes a little bit of extra work, but um, it can extend your growing season. Also, I would not recommend black plastic for landscaped, uh, for other landscaped areas. Um, it's just, it can re result in more problems than, than it resolves or prevents. But what about trees? What about, what about other types of gardens? Well, we have a fact sheet that breaks down all of the different types of mulching materials, like straw, for example, it can be good, but if we work it into the soil, as it decomposes, it can eat up excess nitrogen as, as it's broken down by microbes. So there's, you know, there's just so many little facets of, of gardening that exist within this IPM, this integrated pest management, this, this ecosystems approach to gardening. And again, it's where we're here to help or ask an expert or, or Google with that special search term, term that site colon dot edu trick. Uh, yes, so next up, right, mechanical means of control. I, I wanna bring up the case of fire blight because it's another really challenging kind of case. Fire blight is caused by a bacteria uh, called uh, Arrhenia amylivora and it's spread to the blossoms of trees, of predominantly apple and pear trees by pollinators. So 
pollinator picks up this bacteria, um, spreads it to a, a, a new apple blossom, the bacteria then enters the tree and over the course of many years, it can work its way in deeper and deeper and deeper into the tree to where it can enter into the trunk of a tree and the tree just can become a reservoir to further pass on fire blight to other bees, which then spread it you know, across this greater ecosystem. It's a bacteria. So there do exist antibiotics for fire blight. And as you might think, there do exist antibiotic resistant varieties of fire blight. There also do exist a few other chemical treatments for, for fire blight that can be used. But really, those types of products are more frequently employed by you know, production orchards. So for the home, uh, for the like resident of Colorado with, with fire blight in their tree, our recommendation, my recommendation would be to prune it out. You know, so you would go like six or maybe a few more inches, depending on where the nearest break or the nearest joint is in a tree, six inches inward to the tree from a point of cankering. By canker, I mean, it's like a sunken portion. It's a little darker. It looks gnarly, kind of like this picture in the slide, exactly like this picture in the slide. So you go inwards, you make a cut. You cut it out mechanically. That's really... I would say one of the, the best ways we can, we can handle or manage fire blight. But here's the thing, you have to um, sanitize your implements, your cutting tools, your pruning shears or saws, whatever it might be after every cut or else you may be spreading this bacteria from one cut inwards to the next cut in. And really the point I want to drive home with this slide is that it, it's really important to know what you're dealing with. You know, so if my tree is looking a little funky, it might be worth sending a sample to the CSU uh, plant, um, uh, plant testing lab laboratory or to the Jeffco plant clinic, or again, an extension office could probably help you as well. Or send some pictures to ask an expert so that we can tell you what it is or give you an idea for what we think it might be um, that's harming your tree. Another quick, a quick tool I want to add on this topic is solarizing. So imagine you have a, a patch of your lawn that's just full, or a patch of your landscape maybe, it's not a lawn yet, that's just full of weeds. Um, you, wanna, you want to remediate this area, you want it to become a garden, but you don't want to use any chemical products perhaps, or maybe you do. Solarizing is the process of like essentially baking out weeds and weed seeds in an area. And so you would lay down a, a layer of clear plastic. Details for this, all of this can be found in the, this fact sheet that I linked, uh, that I have a picture of. But you lay down a layer of clear plastic, um, water the grass or ground if you can ahead of time, and the sun will heat up that area, bake out the weeds, over the course of four to six weeks during summer, right? So it's not the most sightly. There are some limitations to when this is effective, but it's a mechanical means by which we can address a problem potentially in, in some locations. Okay, biological controls and chemical controls up next. But before that, I want to briefly touch on organic uh, pest control or organic means of control. Organic can mean many different things, depending on who you talk to. The USDA does have a definition for what organic is. And I'll say it, it, is a, it is not a cut and dry definition by any means. But the first couple points of that, it's crop rotation, right? A garden that implements uh, or a producer that implements an organic approach to pest control would be utilizing crop rotation. It would be removing the habitat for pest organisms. This is IPM. This is exactly what we talked about with cultural controls. Um, and I also want to note that organic doesn't necessarily mean non-synthetic um, because 
there are synthetic products that are considered organic. For example, sticky traps and barriers. Um, certain sticky traps are considered to be an organic method of pest control. Same with insecticidal soaps like uh, potassium salts of fatty acids. I'll touch on that one a little bit later in the chemical um, part of the presentation. So all I want to say here is organic doesn't necessarily mean it's bright and it's safe and it's wonderful. It doesn't mean it's bad either. It just is a complex definition and it can mean different things to different people. And underlying all of this, the way you can keep yourself safe is just kind of being informed, really. I, it, that's what it comes down to, to knowing the products that you're using and to reading the, reading the labels, really. Those are the two most critical things I can recommend. Okay, biocontrols, and I'll, then I'll get back to chemical in a, in a minute. So tomato spotted wilt virus, as you can see in this picture, it's not the most high resolution picture, but this tomato spotted wilt virus, it causes kind of a mottled, kind of pixelated look to tomatoes, to be honest. It, it will eventually just completely kill a tomato plant. It's, it's spread, oh, and also there, there are no treatments for tomato spotted wilt virus, no chemical products that you can apply to, to fix your plant. Our recommendation is just to pull it out or prevent it from ever occurring. It is spread by thrips, the, these other insects. Thrips will often, they'll suck out some of the, um, uh, oh gosh, I just, uh, I forgot the name of, what are, uh, the chlorophyll, there we go. They'll suck out some of the chlorophyll from a leaf and they'll leave their black refuse in the same locations. And so you kind of get this weird characteristic faded, but lots of black speckled dots on a leaf. That's, that's uh, a sign of um, thrips. Anyway, the thrips transmit tomato spotted wilt virus. And so if we can control for the thrips, we can prevent the virus from ever entering our tomato plants. The challenge though is if your tomato has to come to this, it's already too late, right? The virus is present in the tomato. And we know that the virus can persist in the, in the soil for multiple years. So our recommendation is to plant your tomatoes or your nightshades in another area of your garden in the following year. So, but again, if we can control the thrips, thinking of an IPM approach, right? Let's, let's see this larger ecosystem. Well, then we can prevent at least reduce the likelihood of tomato spotted wilt virus from damaging our tomatoes. And then when I'm thinking about thrips, like, okay, I see these spots on my tomato leaf. What am I gonna do now? If you want, you can Google this. You can ask an extension agent, ask an expert, whatever it might be. I did a search uh, before this presentation just to see what would come up for uh, thrips control site colon dot edu. I got an extension web page, and I wanted to note that the management goes through an IPM approach, right? Cultural practices, biological controls, monitoring techniques for thrips so that we can address these problems. And the site colon.edu trick, it's, it's pretty decent broadly, but at the same time, it's like it might pull up a uh, a page about citrus trees in Florida, right? That is not gonna be the most relevant or pertinent info for a, a Colorado gardener who's wanting to plant some sort of fruit trees. So it's just, it's a decent trick, but be mindful for sure of what you're searching. Biocontrols. So what if we could use insects to battle insects, right? Because it's a large ecosystem at work here. It's not just a tomato plant, it's a, it's a thrips on a tomato plant and there are insects and, and, and other organisms that would love to feed on the thrips. Um, lady beetles are one of the common, more common biocontrols that are sold at plant nurseries. And the point with lady beetles or ladybugs, as I, as I grew up calling them, is the adults are not nearly as effective as the larvae. 
the, the larval forms. I think it, there's an order of magnitude almost of difference in terms of quantity of insects that these two predators eat. Plus the adults will fly around and fly off and the, the earlier stages, the juveniles, well, they're landlocked, right? So biocontrols, uh, lady, lady beetles are incredibly effective, but choose to get the eggs and the larval, larval forms if you can. And I have a source for where you can find a whole range of biocontrols that I'll share with you in just a minute. Another common biocontrol are lace wings. Um, these are so ravenous that the reason I have them in this slide, in fact, is, is for the short piece of advice that if you are interested in biocontrols for managing aphids or other soft bodied insects, like we're not talking scale insects, just soft bodied things, to be very, to use them as quickly as you get them. So you would order these essentially as eggs. You would get maybe a thousand eggs or maybe 10K, depends on what your situation is, how large your garden is, right? What are you trying to treat? There's so many questions that go into that. But once you get the eggs, use them as quickly as you can because they'll hatch in a couple of days and these um, juvenile forms of the lacewing will cannibalize one another. They're that ravenous that they'll just eat each other in the bag and you'll be left with one or two large insects. Um, so use them as quickly as you can. Uh, don't, don't dilly dally, I think, with, with biocontrols. They're living organisms. They wanna be in their ecosystem. Biocontrols also pertain to bacteria and uh, to bacteria and to fungus. So Bacillus thuringiensis often often uh, it'll be abbreviated as BT or BTI BTG. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis is a common soil bacteria. There are many different varieties. Many have been bred to a specifically uh, target a specific subset of insects. For example, the Galeriae, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis Galeriae variety targets white grubs and not necessarily mosquitoes. The way this, this product works is the, the bacteria produces a toxin, insects will ingest that toxin, you know, such as like, like fungus gnats. Those essentially, they look like, um, they look like fruit flies essentially but they, can, they live in potted soil. I had a massive, massive outbreak of fungus gnats. I bought an indoor fig tree and my whole apartment was full of these things. So it's like, well, what can I do? I bought some Bacillus thuringiensis granules, applied it as directed, watered it in as directed. And honestly, it, it resolved my issue of indoor fungus gnats, which again, look like fruit flies. But the way this product works, the insects, the fungus gnats will ingest this and it just tears up their insides. Like it's kind of gruesome, but it's important to know that's, that's the way you're treating these insects with the soil, with this biocontrol. Another one uh, biocontrol would be Bouveria bassinia. It's a fungus. I just, I, I include this one to say that biocontrols can be insects, they can be fungus, they can be bacteria. But this soil fungus may be pathogenic to honeybees. So again, this is organic, it's a biocontrol, but it could be harmful to our most, some of our most important pollinators. So it's just important to, to do a little extra research, or if you're not interested in that, you know, call a specialist where we'd be happy to help. So if you're interested in biocontrols, a professor, a recently retired professor from CSU, Whitney Cranshaw and a team of others put together a wonderful, wonderful resource that goes, that is broken down pest group by pest group and lists potential biocontrols that would, you know, control for aphids, for example. And it lists where you can buy those. And I'd be happy to share this uh, resource with you if you are interested. Chemical products, okay. I've just got a couple more slides and then we should have a few minutes for questions. We're still in the organic realm. Horticultural vinegar 
is essentially a more concentrated version of the stuff you might put on a salad, right? A household vinegar, maybe 5% acetic acid vinegar can scar uh, hands at around 11% and horticultural vinegar is often sold at concentrations of upwards of 35%. And I've included a whole bunch of labels of for horticultural vinegar products on this slide. It's a really messy slide, but take a look at those graphics. They look pretty friendly, right? It's uh, the one with the corn picture. Oh, it's non-toxic and chemical free, powerful, effective. It's, it's great, it's safe, it's wonderful for everyone. The point is that I have with the slide is it's still an acid. Um, the way horticultural vinegar would be applied is, is more frequently as an herbicide um, and it would burn down, it would kill say uh, a, small, a small weedy plant go growing in the cracks between um, pieces of pavement, but it would burn it down to the soil level, but not necessarily kill all of the roots. It wouldn't necessarily work its way into the roots of that weed. And so the energy in that root that would re be remaining would be expensed, you know, regrowing this plant. So you'd have to apply this product again until that energy in the root of a weed is uh, has been dispensed, right? But again, my, my point with this slide, the most important point is really read the labels. And even if something is labeled as organic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's safe for humans, right? So wear eye protection, wear gloves. You might wanna change your clothes, wear some clothes or follow the label. That's certainly what they're made for. They'll go topic by topic and, and tell you how you should treat a product. Um, another chemical product, horticultural oils. There are a huge range of horticultural oils. And generally, some of them work by clogging the spiracles, the breathing holes in, in, that certain insects have. Um, there's a whole bunch of information on this in our insect control horticultural oils fact sheet. But um, the reason I, I bring up hort oils is really because of neem oil. It's super popular, right? Maybe you've heard of neem oil. Neem will often, well, there are two components to neem oil. One, it may work by that same mode of action, but there are, there's a, there's a chemical within neem oil as it's extracted called azadirectin. And we're, some of the research suggests that it may have a secondary effect um, on insects, right? It may, it may have some repellent properties, but it may affect the hormones of insects. And so if you're buying neem oil, what we have found is that some chemical companies will extract as a directin and repackage it and still have the refuse, the, the older neem oil and sell these as two separate products. So if you want the most bang for your buck, try to read your label and make sure it has the product as a directin in it. Um, Again, the point here is to be mindful of the labels and try to do some research and, and know what you're buying. I think the last chemical product I want to discuss is um, insecticidal soap. Uh, if you buy insecticidal soap, you'll be looking for something that contains potassium salts of fatty acids. This, this stuff is like the old fashioned soap are, are that grandparents may have used. It's not a dish detergent or a hand soap. The, the soap products these days have a lot of surfactants in them, which can poke holes in lipid layers and really tear up like leaves. But insecticidal soaps are a little bit safer to use generally on plants. But the thing is, certain plants are very, very, very sensitive to having products sprayed on their leaves. And so it's important to read the labels for these products. They'll tell you what the product is good for and what plants it can be applied on and where these products can be applied. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna 
go over, I'm going to skip over this one really quickly because I want to get to the point of um, the Xerxes Society. There are so many products that exist for, for residents to buy that they can apply to their gardens, to their lawns, to their trees. It's very hard to keep up with. And the question I get most frequently is, will this product hurt pollinators if I spray it on my flowers, you know, if I spray a, a product with, if I spray a, a flower with some product and a bee lands there, is it going to hurt the bee? Well, I don't know in many cases, but the Xerxes Society is dedicated to researching all of this. I mean, they're dedicated to preserving pollinators and beneficial insects. And so I would highly recommend if you're interested to check out the Xerxes Society, xerxes.org or this is a level of research that an extension agent or extension staffer would do on your behalf, for sure. It's just, a, it's a great resource that we have available. Um, really quickly, and then I will try to get to all your questions. Uh, I wanna talk about Grow and Give just very quickly. The program was started last year and the idea is that we as extension, across the state can connect growers and gardeners to local hunger relief organizations. And so the intention here is, hey, grow a couple extra plants and donate some of your extra produce to neighbors who may be in need or to those local hunger relief organizations. Last year, we connected with upwards of 600 gardens and we, we saw about 50,000 pounds of produce donated across the state to local hunger relief organizations. I mean, and for 2021, we're going bigger and better. Uh, we have more robust resources. Our communications are much more solid. We have, a, we have a newsletter that will be going out about twice a month to inform people about, um, you know, best seed starting practices or, hey, Okay, now we're in midsummer. Here are some things you might want to be aware of. Like we are, our goal accessible for every Colorado and as possible, and then to help um, facilitate donations of produce if gardeners are so inclined. So that's in a nutshell what Grow and Give is about. Um, again, GrowandGiveColorado.org. If you're looking for any of these resources, um, they were all made with IPM in mind, right? IPM being this ecosystem approach of looking at various parameters of a system and addressing those, manipulating a few variables here and there to most effectively achieve your desired outcome. Um, that is what I have for this presentation, uh, but I would love to you know, enter into a dialogue with the rest of our time and answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. I learned a lot. I was taking notes over here uh, behind the scenes. So thank you. It's pretty you. quick. I apologize for the pace. <laughs> no, that's okay. I know we have, we're short on time with only an hour. And obviously, as you can all tell, there are so many awesome resources that CSU Extension offers. So I put a lot of links in the chat throughout, but I also thank in our post event email, will kind of put some of those awesome links. Yeah. John shared out to share out with everybody so you have those as well. Um, one of the questions that we do have though, John, is do you have any suggestions for Japanese beetles? Oh boy. <laughs> Japanese beetles are, ah, Japanese beetles are a huge problem uh, because we do not. I do not have any great suggestions. We do have, okay, so we know the life cycle of the Japanese beetle. We know when it emerges, we know when products can be applied. Um, but the challenge with Japanese beetle is that if one person treats their lawn for Japanese beetles, that's, they love moist lawn environments, Kentucky bluegrass lawns with like, with moist soil is like ideal for them. Anyway, if one person treats their lawn for Japanese beetle, but the neighbors and surrounding area don't, you're still gonna have problems with Japanese beetles in the following year. We don't have any great chemical products either available. I have two things I can suggest. One, avoid any Japanese beetle traps, uh, especially with pheromone lures, because those will bring in Japanese beetles for miles and miles around to those traps. They're effective, but they can result in a, in a greater problem. 
than you may have originally had had you not have installed a trap with those lures. And second, really the, the best treatment I know, and it's not a great one, but it would be to get a bucket of soapy water and to knock off Japanese beetles, say on a rose, into that soapy water. I mean, that's, that's really what we've got. It, they're a challenge. And I know there's a lot of research being done on these, um, but to my knowledge, that's what I got. They are definitely tricky. <laughs> yeah, they so, certainly are. Thank you for that advice on there. Um, we don't have any other open questions. Yeah. We do have a couple more minutes if anyone else wants to jump in. Sure. Oh, we've got, we got somebody here. Let's see, she okay. has a long question here. American Elm next to the fence on neighbor's yes. side by her vegetable garden. Corporate. Been applying, I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> You got I made a clopid, yeah. Do we need to worry about this chemical being taken up by my vegetables? There's one to two feet, one and a half feet between the garden base and the tree. Hmm. Okay, so you're applying the imidacloprid to an elm tree and about two and a half feet away, you have vegetable a vegetable patch. Um, this is a question seriously, where I would want to get a little more information from you. I'd be happy to chat via email even about this question. Just what comes to my mind is, I don't know. I would want to know a little more about the, the location you live in. What is the soil like? Are we talking really clay soil? Are we talking decomposed granite? Are you at high altitudes? I guess you have an elm tree, so I wouldn't imagine that. <laughs> um, but are there slopes involved? I don't know. Uh, I would want to do some research on that too, because I'm not sure how far imidacloprid can spread through the soil as a medium. Um, it, that's just, that's a standard extension answer because I don't know, but I'm not um, going to give you bad information. You know, I'm just gonna be honest when I don't know about something. And so um, let me, my email in the chat, I would welcome you to email me um, some more information about this and I try to get you an answer. Awesome. I'll reshare that too. It looks like that went to all panelists, John. So we'll get that into the, okay. so all the attendees can see that too. We have yeah, one that's question okay. that we will definitely get to here for you all. Um, and thanks so much for answering that. I know that's a very specific question, but thanks for asking it, Linda. Um, we have someone curious, are there any safe ways to get rid of voles? Voles? Um. <laughs> This crosses into natural resources a little bit for me. Uh, so it's a little bit outside of my direct area, um, but I think there are some mechanical vole traps that can be effective. I think that was the question, right? Are there non-toxic uh, means for controlling voles? I think there are some vole traps. I know for certain, I absolutely, that we have some fact sheets on voles, but I'm not, up to date on you know the the most recent information on that topic. Awesome, thank you. Definitely a lot of resources on CSU Extension's website, and I did go ahead and put John's email in the chat for you all. Um, and there are also horticulture agents in your county, depending on where you may be from. So definitely utilize those awesome resources. But you have a friend in John as well if you need to reach out to him. Yeah, that's what um, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, did you have any final words, John, that you wanted to share with us before we wrap just, up today? Just thanks again for um, inviting me to speak with you all. I know there's a ton of info to cover, but really uh, thank you for sharing my email with, with the group. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. That's really what I'm here for. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. And thank you to our series sponsor, Fossil Creek Nursery. Um, I've put their link in the chat and I also put our survey link in the chat as well, if you'd like to give us some feedback for how you felt today's presentation went. Uh, but thanks again, John, and to everybody out there, stay safe, stay, stay stalwart and go Rams. Take care, everybody.